Good morning. So glad to see everybody. We're going to stand together as we go into a time of worship this morning. We're going to lift your name high on this Sunday morning. Good to be here together today, and we have a couple announcements as we get started. Uh, first of all, uh, we do still need some items for our children's store, and all of those details are in the bulletin. If you have any questions, you can uh, you can ask. Um, second is uh, we are going to have or participate in a blood drive. Uh, Terry Calhoun uh, is a member of the Rock Island Church, and he's asked us to partner with him on this as he celebrates his 80th birthday and his 100th gallon of blood that he has donated. So. Details are in the bulletin on that if you would like to participate on September 16th. Um, also, how many of you have downloaded the church app in the App Store? A couple of you have. I updated it this week, and so you might want to look at it. It should be a little bit easier to use. Um, in fact, one of the new features is that sermon notes are now going to be in the app. So you can click on a button and you'll see my sermon notes from the week before. 
I did not put them in there as of yet for today, because I know some of you would read through and say, I don't need to stay for this and then leave, but <laughs> they will be populated. As soon as the video is uploaded, um, then uh, I'll populate the, the sermon notes. So if you want to go back um, for that part that you fell asleep for, you're welcome to do that. And you can search for that in the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's pray as we get ready to begin our service. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your love for us and the privilege that we have of being in this place today. I know that as we come into this place, that we come in with a lot of stuff on our minds, a lot of stuff on our hearts, all the realities of this world including the chaos that we see in the situation with North Korea that has all of us feeling a little bit uneasy. And In that situation, we pray for wisdom and discernment for all of the leaders that are involved. Father, we also pray for the violence that broke out yesterday in Virginia. And uh, our heart breaks with the amount of hatred that still exists in our culture. And I pray for peace. And I pray that you will help us as your people to represent true love and what you truly want us to be and what you want us to represent in the places where we find ourselves. Father, we thank you that no matter how chaotic life may be, that you are with us. And we ask for your help to live out your presence in this world. Speak to our hearts and encourage us today through the music, through our conversations, through the message, that we may leave this place better equipped to represent you and the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, a psalm that I want us to read as we get started this morning, it's a psalm that David wrote in a time of chaos in his life. And he said, praise the Lord, let all that I am praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God with my dying breath. Don't put your confidence in powerful people. There is no help for you there. When they breathe their last, they return to the earth, and all their plans die with them. But joyful are those who have the God of Israel as their helper, whose hope is in the Lord their God. For he made the heaven and the earth, the sea and everything in them. He keeps every promise forever. He gives justice to the oppressed and food to the hungry. The Lord frees the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are weighed down. The Lord loves the godly. The Lord protects the foreigners among us. He cares for the orphans and widows, but he frustrates the plans of the wicked. The Lord will reign forever. He will be your God, O Jerusalem, throughout the generations. Praise the Lord. David wrote this psalm while he was hidden in a cave, hiding from Saul who was chasing him. And I think it can speak to us today in the chaos that we see in the world around us. Because quite honestly, there are days, and this week has been one of them, when I think, you know, hiding in a cave doesn't sound like such a bad idea. Because it's so messy, it's so chaotic, and, and yet what David found in that cave is that he could trust in God, no matter how overwhelming life seemed. So as we stand to worship this morning, let that thought be in our minds, that no matter what we're facing, no matter how overwhelming life may seem, we can trust in the God of Israel. Let's stand together. There's no space that his love can reach. There's no place where we can't find peace. There's no Love like this. 
Oh 
go into our prayer time now with our prayer chorus, prayer chorus hungry. As we come into this place, I know that we come carrying burdens. A lot of us are dealing with some pretty tough stuff right now. And so as we sing through this chorus again, I encourage you to find whatever position is the most comfortable for you to allow you to cry out to God. So if you want to be seated, if you want to remain standing, if you want to come forward, our altars are open. If you'd like special prayer, Pastor Larry and Meyer will be in the corner. They would be happy to pray with you. I know this is one of those times when there's a lot going on in our world, and it's unsettling. But I also know there's a lot going on in our personal lives, and that's unsettling too. But the awesome thing is that when we come into the presence of our God, no matter what we're facing, no matter what's weighing heavily on us, He's there to meet us. And I think His desire today is to give us peace, to give us hope in the midst of the chaos. And I pray that, uh, that as we spend this time with Him, that peace will settle over our hearts. So again, if you want to be seated, if you want to remain standing, if you want to come forward, whatever you would like to do, but let's spend some time in prayer this morning. Father, thank you so much for all the ways that you show your love to us. And most importantly, by being a God who is relational. 
a God who relates to us on a very personal level, that knows all there is to know about us, that listens when we cry out, that responds in what is with what is best. And Father, this morning as we come into this place, I know that our hearts are heavy for many things. Our hearts are heavy for where our nation is at and the division that just keeps popping up over and over again, the hatred and the bitterness. Our hearts are heavy for our world and, and all the uncertainties. And our hearts are heavy for things that we're facing on a personal level. And so this morning as we come together, we are so thankful that you are the God that holds it all together. And even though it feels like things are spinning out of control, you are still God. And you do still have your hand on all that's going on. And Father, this morning, as we take a few moments to silently lift up our concerns, I pray that you'll help us to release to you those anxieties that weigh us down and to allow your peace to spread over us. Father, I thank you that you hear us when we pray. We're not just talking to hear ourselves talk. We're not just thinking positive thoughts. But we are indeed communicating with the maker of all the universe. And Father, for those here this morning who are facing difficult challenges, for the several who are facing cancer, trying to figure out treatment options and processing realities of treatment. We lift them up to you. We pray specifically this morning for Connie Harris, a sister-in-law who was just diagnosed with skin cancer this week. We continue to pray for Chad Larson as he continues this treatment and these things aren't always as easy to take in the treatment process. And we lift up Dave Pinnock as well. Father, we thank you that you are the great physician, and that the power to heal is in your hands. And we thank you that in your wisdom you have not just been a God who can heal, but you are also a God who gives humans creativity, and you have given doctors wisdom to treat these illnesses. So Father, for all of these that are facing these challenges, I just pray for your hand to be upon them, and be with their families during this time as well. Father, I thank you that no matter what we're facing, whether it's a physical concern or whether it's challenges in a relationship or whether it's financial challenges, that no matter what we're facing, you are God. And you want to reach down to us in our place of need and remind us of who we are, that we are your children. You want to form us into your image. Father, I pray that you will do that among us. That you would help us to reflect you well. That we would truly be your people. And that we would live lives that speak loudly without words of who our God is. Father, in times when we're not exactly sure what to say, we find great comfort and great joy in praying together the prayer that your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And you may be seated.
ushers would come forward at this time. We'll continue to worship through the giving of our tithes and offerings. Pray for our this morning. Lord, thank you for being with us in your Holy Spirit and for our fellowship together. Thank you for all that you do for everyone in this world every day and every way. Please bless our offering today for all power, honor, praise, and glory is yours forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for our worship team this morning. Thank you, Amy, for coming back and helping us out. We have spent the last month or so in the book of Jeremiah. And uh, as I've told you before, Jeremiah is a lot harder than I thought Jeremiah was going to be. But this morning, I want us to start by celebrating. Because today is a milestone day for me. 20 years ago today, I saw a mountain for the first time. That mountain, specifically. Now, for those of you who like the Smoky Mountains, I'd been to the Smoky Mountains before. I used to call them the Smoky Mountains. Now I call them the Smoky Hills. Because there's a big difference between the massive Pikes Peak and those rolling hills. But 20 years ago today, I landed in Colorado Springs. It was a tough journey for me to end up in Colorado Springs. Um, Just so you know what I looked like back then, I had hair (laughs) and weighed about 100 pounds less than I weigh now. And my dad was so proud that he put that picture in the newspaper. Now, I grew up in a really small town and there was no news. And just in case you're wondering, I was going to be a youth pastor. Aren't we all glad that didn't happen? I know I certainly am. I ended up in Colorado Springs 13 years ago today. I left on the 11th, traveled the 12th, and got into Colorado Springs late in the evening. It was dark and it was crazy because We were all a bunch of country bumpkins, and we didn't know how to get around town. And in Colorado Springs, I think we spent 20 minutes getting across one intersection. I I don't even know how that happened, but I remember people weren't paying attention in my family. There was a three-car caravan, and one vehicle would go, and then the other person wasn't paying attention, and so they'd have to wait a while, and it was a long light cycle. And then the next person would go, and just crazy. We were country bumpkins in, in the big city. Just so you know, where I grew up, you had to drive 12 miles to see a stoplight, and that one was flashing. But 20 years ago today, I remember waking up, and we stayed at a hotel that as I got to know the the springs, I would not stay in again. But I walked out of the hotel, and there was a restaurant in front of the hotel, and we had agreed that we were going to meet at that restaurant for breakfast. And so... 
I, I walked out of the hotel and got put stuff in my car, and I happened to glance up and see this thing. And I'll be honest with you, I absolutely love the mountains now. But when I first saw Pikes Peak, I was not impressed. Because it was like this, it, it didn't have any snow on it, it was August. And I just looked up and I saw, thought, what's the big deal about the big rock? Can't believe I would even say that now. But, but I remember that thought process. I remember how frustrating it was for me to look around and see how bland the scenery was. Now, for this picture, I, it's taken from Nazarene Bible College campus. There are a few trees on the campus of Nazarene Bible College. But where I come from in Indiana, and I think we would agree here in Iowa, the trees that they have in Colorado are not really trees. They're more like shrubs. Because they're no taller than this building. You know, I come from a place where there's trees. It was a different world for me, though. Living in Colorado Springs, and I knew no one west of the Mississippi River. I'd never even seen the Mississippi River until two days before. And I can remember in that period of time, feeling so lost. I had no clue who I was or why I was there. My classes weren't as easy as I thought they were going to be. And I had this Bible I used then. It's the Living Bible. It's before I learned a little bit about translations. And it was also before I realized anything about Studying the Bible in context, which means that I would just basically open it up, point, and read that verse, and that was my word for the day. In case you're wondering, that's not the way we're supposed to read the Bible. One guy did that, and he opened it up, and he pointed, and it said, and Judas went out and hanged himself. Wow, I don't want that. So he turned somewhere else and pointed, go and do likewise. That, that's not how we're supposed to read the Bible. That's not how we're supposed to study the Bible, just so you know. But I had this Bible, and I... I was reading one day in Exodus, and I found this verse. Then the Lord said to Moses, go back again and make your demand upon Pharaoh, but I have hardened him and his officials so that I can do more miracles demonstrating my power. What stories you can tell your children and grandchildren about the incredible things I am doing in Egypt. Tell them what fools I have made of the Egyptians and how I prove to you that I am Jehovah. And it was one of those nights, I can remember it very vividly, that was back in the day where I had a computer. It was Windows based, but it was Windows 3. Anybody remember Windows 3.1? And I had an email address. It was Juno. And it was dial-up. And you had to push the button and wait for all these buzzes. And then maybe a few minutes later, you would get a message back. And I came home from class very discouraged, and I pushed the button on Juno, and there were no emails. And I just felt all alone. I knew no one west of the Mississippi. There was a, a time difference. I couldn't call anybody because it was too late at, ni at night. And I opened my Bible, and I read this passage, and I wrote in the, the margin. You can see here where I wrote, my purpose in Colorado. The only purpose I could see for me being there was that I would come up with stories to tell people about how miserable these Coloradoans are. They don't even have trees. And they get so excited about big rocks. And that was my mindset. Now that was a tough journey for me because I didn't know anybody. And, and the first roommate that I met who was, that I had was 10 years older than me. And his mom and dad still paid his bills. And he was the biggest slob I have ever met in my life. The apartment that we had, our first apartment that we had, the only apartment I had with that gentleman, um, when we moved out, they sent us a bill because they ate up all of our deposit and they still had sent us a bill for like 500 bucks to clean it. And I'd gone to, to Chad before we, as we were ending our time together, and I said, Chad, when do we want to meet to clean? He said, oh, I never clean. I just let them eat up the deposit. That was a $500 deposit 20 years ago. That was a, a chunk of change. And I was just so ready to be away from Chad that I said, okay, I'm good with that. And 
they sent us a bill for $500 beyond the deposit. And I called Chad up. Actually, I called the apartment complex first and said, can you tell me where the bulk of this expense came from? And it was his bedroom. They described it. So I just called Chad up and I said, you can call your parents and let them know they're going to have to pay this because I'm not paying it. It's your room. But all I could think of my time in Colorado was I'm just coming up with stories because this is a miserable place and these are miserable people. Now, I've grown a little bit in 20 years, literally, and figuratively, I've grown a little bit. I'm not the same person that I used to be. I, I view life differently. But, but in those early days, I received a letter. And I've shared this letter with you before. I, I found this letter that my dad had written me on August 17th of 1997. So 20 years ago this week. And, and my dad wrote this letter just telling me how proud he was of me and how, how he knew that this was going to be tough for me to live 1,200 miles from anybody that I knew. And I can remember the emotion receiving this letter. I can remember the tears just falling as I was in my room with this slob who I had just found had cooked steak. And I found the way that he did dishes after cooking steak was to take my dishcloth and wipe it out with, wipe the, the grease up with my dishcloth and stick it down the garbage disposal. And a couple weeks later, we couldn't figure out what the smell was. I'm not joking, this guy was a slob. Thankfully, we had a window. And I had tongs. And I grabbed that down in there with the, and slung it out the window, and the cats went crazy at the dumpster. <laughs> Thankfully, I didn't hit anybody. This letter was a letter that, that really meant a lot to me. And it means more now that my father has been gone for 10 plus years. It's a letter that reminds me of who I am, of where I came from, and that my dad believed that I could make it, even at a time when I didn't believe that I could make it. I was absolutely alone. This week in Jeremiah, we come across a letter to a group of people who have been displaced, a group of people who have been taken from their homeland thousands of miles away from where they grew up. <clears throat> and it's a letter that says, you're going to make it. It's going to be tough, but you can do this. There's hope. Part of the passage that we're going to read this morning is Jeremiah 29, 11. Now, I, I tread carefully here because this is one of those coffee cup verses. See, I even have a coffee cup with Jeremiah 29, 11. A family member gave it to, you, to me. It wasn't anybody here, so I can say this. This is probably one of the verses that is taken out of context more than any other verse in Scripture. It's, it's taken as a personal promise, but as we're going to read, that's not exactly how it was written. That's not how it was attended, intended. Now, I say that, and I'm nervous preaching this this morning because I know several of you are going to be pretty upset because this verse has meant a lot to you. I'm not trying to take away from that. I believe God can use this verse, even if you take it out of context. But I think it's important for us to understand what context God intended this verse to be in. And it's not just to look good when you drink coffee. And I do like the colors of this. It reminds me of the Indiana Hoosiers. It's just the right color. Let's read together from Jeremiah 29. This is what the Lord of Heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says to all the captives that he has exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. Build homes and plan to stay. Plant gardens and eat the food that they produce. Marry and have children. Then find spouses for them so that you may have many grandchildren. Multiply, do not dwindle away. And work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says. Do not let your prophets and fortune tellers who are with you in the land of Babylon trick you. Do not listen to their dreams, because they are telling you lies in my name. 
I have not sent them, says the Lord. This is what the Lord says. You will be in Babylon for 70 years, but then I will come and do for you all the good things I have promised, and I will bring you back home again. A little bit of a drum roll. Thank you. <laughs> for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They're plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. And in those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will end your captivity and restore your fortunes. I will gather you out of the nations where I sent you and bring you home again to your own land. The letter continues and Jeremiah berates the, Babylon, or the, the false prophets who are telling them all kinds of lies. And I won't read all of that today. But I want us to think about this passage in Jeremiah. Now remember that Jeremiah is prophetic literature. That means that it reads differently than a history text. It means that it reads differently than the Psalms. It reads differently than the Gospels. Prophetic literature is literature that's written to a specific audience. In this situation, he was writing this letter to a group of people who had been unwillingly uprooted. They had been taken from their homeland and they had been taken to a land far away. Now when they got to Babylon, they were given free reign as long as they didn't go back home. Meaning that they were allowed to live life as they would, they just couldn't go back home. It was written to an audience who desperately wanted more than anything to come back home. It was written at a specific time. It was written at a time when when people, when people were, were struggling because they didn't know who they were, where they were. Now I can remember when I first got to Colorado, I had no identity at all. I was just another Bible college student. Now when I left Indiana, I was a leader in my church. I was well respected in my church. Little things. I drove a pickup in Indiana. It was a little red Toyota pickup truck. And I drove that thing hard. The police knew me too well. But when I moved to Colorado, it was a rear-wheel drive pickup truck. And everybody told me, you don't want a rear-wheel drive pickup truck in Colorado because it snows there. And so I traded in my pickup truck and I bought a 91 Buick Regal. Now it was a nice car. But it was a car. And so for me, I can remember just feeling lost in a car. I, I didn't know anybody. I, I didn't like cars, even though it was quite a bit quicker than my truck was. It got up well above 100, where the truck struggled to get to 100. Not that I know that. And Olivia, not that you're paying attention to that. But it was a car. All of my identity was gone. I wasn't a good student. And that was my only reason for being in Colorado was to study. My roommate, who I had envisioned would be a good friend, disgusted me so much that after the first week or two, I couldn't stand to be around him. And we'd signed a six-month lease. That period of time for me is very different than the period I'm in right now, 20 years later. Right now, I think my roommate's really cute. And she's a good cook, and she helped me to be clean instead of being... I was a slob, but I wasn't Chad slob. I like the life I have now, but 20 years can make a lot of difference. This letter was written at a very specific time, early on, in the exile's time in Babylon. And there are many universal truths that can be taken from prophetic literature, but we have to be cautious because not everything applies. As we talked a couple of weeks ago when we read about Jeremiah saying, your wives are going to be given to other people. That was very specific to that culture. When you conquered a land, you took their wives. We don't do that anymore. There some things that are very specific and some things that are universal. So we have to be cautious when we approach prophetic literature. 
Jeremiah is a very difficult book to read. And as I said before, I had no idea what I was getting into. I didn't take a course. Did you take a course on Jeremiah in seminary? I didn't take that course. I had no idea what I was getting into when I started preaching through Jeremiah. It's difficult because it wasn't written as a book. It was compiled as many components that were put together later, but we don't even know how much later. And there are variations as to how this, there are different versions of the book. Meaning there's one version that's written in Greek that they believe was the version that came out of Egypt, which is where Jeremiah ended up after all this mess, that had things in a different order than the other version that was written in Hebrew that came, we believe, out of Babylon. Babylon. And it's just a guess that they came from Egypt and Babylon. The truth is we just have two versions of this book. One's significantly shorter and they have things in different orders. Jeremiah is tough. And we don't even know when the final form that we have was developed. We know that it exists in the Dead Sea Scrolls, so it was at least formed by then. But both versions are found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's confusing. It's a difficult book to read. And a part of that is because there's letters that are just put together. Sermons put together. And they're not in chronological order, which is what we're looking for when we read things. We want it all to flow. This came first and then this. So Jeremiah 29 is a letter written to those who are in exile. It's a letter written really to refute false prophets. And much of what Jeremiah is saying is to not trust those who are misleading you. I didn't read the whole letter because it kind of got mean Jeremiah wasn't the nicest guy as he condemned those who were who were misleading the people and told them what awaited them and it wasn't going to be pretty but it was a letter written to a group and not an individual and I think that's very important for us to understand this letter um, means something to me means a lot to me but quite honestly if you would find this letter laying on the ground and it doesn't even say my name it just says dear son love dad my parents address is on there but if you don't know where Delaney Millport Road is in Bologna Indiana that doesn't mean much who is this letter even to just so you know I looked up my hometown on on I googled it yesterday Millport Indiana you know there's not a single picture on Google of Millport, Indiana. <laughs> there's nothing there. That literally, there's a crossroads and a sign. It says Millport. That's it. This letter means a lot to me. And I hope it means something to my family, but for the rest of you, it means nothing. Because it's an individual letter. One of my dad's jobs was he worked at a paper factory. And at the paper factory, they recycled paper. And so, or paper mill is what they call it, the paper mill. They recycled paper. So you would walk, I'd walk it after I got off work at night. I'd go and say hi to dad. He worked second shift. Usually I was asking him for money because my job didn't pay much and I spent most of what I had on my truck. And I remember walking through the paper factory trying to find dad and there were all these scraps of paper. And you'd look and you'd see pieces of a letter and it meant something to somebody but not to me. But Jeremiah 29 is not a letter that's written to an individual that only means something to one person. It was written to a group. A group who was facing some pretty tough times. And Jeremiah told them to build homes and plan to stay. He told them to plant gardens and eat the food. He told them to marry and have children. And find spouses for the children and spoil the grandkids. He doesn't say that, but I feel like it's probably there. He says, multiply, don't dwindle away. Work for the peace and prosperity of the city that you're in. It's God's will that you're there. So pray for the city. Because its welfare determines yours. The false prophets... We're telling people that they were going home soon. 
You've been brought to Babylon in exile, but have no fear. God is going to send you home very soon. But Jeremiah was telling the people that God said, you're going to be there 70 years. Now there's a big difference between you're going home soon and you're going to be there 70 years. Let me think about that for a minute. How many of you in this room are over 70? And women, I don't expect you to raise your hands. A number of us are over the age of 70. And some of us are younger, but some of us are over the age of 70. If you think about where you were 70 years ago, that was a world, a world of a different place, wasn't it? I mean, Bob, when you were growing up, did they even have electricity in Iowa? No, we have it uh, piped in. Had to have it piped in? Yeah. Okay. 70 years is a long time. And quite honestly, Bob, if you had been taken as one of those exiles, and we talked last week about a group being taken to Canada, and again, why are you going to live in that cold place? But if you're taken to Canada and, and the message comes that you're going to be there 70 years, you're not thinking, I'm going back home. You're thinking my kids and my grandkids are going back home. I'm not. The false prophets were saying, you're going home, you're taking all of the stuff that the Babylonians took, they, they raided the temple, and all that stuff is going back with you. It's just a matter of time. Now, quite honestly, that's the answer that everybody wanted to hear. Nobody wanted to hear the answer that you're going to be there for 70 years, get used to it. They wanted to hear, you're going back home, it's just going to be a couple of weeks, God's working out the visa details. Nobody got that joke. But Jeremiah says, settle down. You're going to end your life there. So plant gardens and eat the food. Now one of the things that I want us to see as we look at this is there's more meaning than just plant gardens because gardens are a part of life. God was saying to the exiles through Jeremiah, when you're in Babylon, eat wisely. Don't buy into the food that they feed you. The food of the Babylonians was a very different kind of food. In fact, we see the story in Daniel chapter 1 of this group of exiles that this letter was sent to. We know some of their names. There's a guy named Daniel. And then there's Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. Or Rackshack and Benny, as VeggieTales would put it. We know four of these guys' names who received this letter from Jeremiah. And the letter said, plant gardens and eat the food that you grow. And in Daniel chapter 1, we see that Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego went when they were called into the king's court and they were, they were assigned positions of leadership in the Babylonian Empire. And they were told... The king's going to provide for you. You're going to have these great meals with this wonderful meat and this wonderful wine every day. And they went to the, the king and they said, please don't view this as disrespect, but we don't eat that way. Would you be willing to give us a trial and let us eat our food, and they ate vegetables, let us eat our food and just drink water Rather than eating your meat and your wine, give us 10 days and see if you feel like we're healthy enough. Because we really don't want to eat the menu that your chefs prepare. And we see in the book of Daniel that they, they took the, the deal. They said, okay, that's fine. And at the end of the 10 days, they were healthier than the men who were eating the meat and drinking the wine. And they said, okay, you can keep your diet. God didn't want them to get so caught up in the menu of the Babylonians that they wouldn't want to go home or their kids wouldn't want to go back home. You know, when I left Indiana, I was used to a certain type of food. Everything had lots of grease on it. My parents were both extremely obese and that's what killed my father was his love for fried chicken, mashed potatoes, and gravy. 
And when I went to Colorado, nobody cooked the way that my mom did. It was a different kind of cooking. It was a different kind of food. There's this difference of diet you don't want to get too used to if you're going to go back home. You don't want to get too used to this way of cooking because they don't do it the same back home. Now for me, I actually lost weight when I went to college because my diet consisted of Totino's pizzas. At that time, they had eight different varieties. I know this because I could go eight days without eating the same kind. My diet consisted of ramen noodles and anything with barbecue sauce. Macaroni and cheese, just add barbecue sauce because I couldn't kick the macaroni to taste right, but the barbecue sauce added to it. Chicken pot pies, just add barbecue sauce. Thank God he sent me Janelle. There's a difference in the food. And what God was saying when he said, plant gardens and eat the food that you grow is, don't buy into the diets of the Babylonians. Don't get so accustomed to it that you're not going to go back home. Marry and have children and grandkids. You see, a part of the, the concern was, well, we don't want to have kids in this environment because we don't want to bring them into this chaos. We're going home soon anyway, aren't we? And yet the message was, marry and have children and grandkids. Settle down. Don't dwindle away. You see, because one of the key differences of the Jewish people compared to everybody else is the reality that they trained their children to be Jews. They train them to be who they are. They train them to keep their identity. And if you're going to be there 70 years, there's not going to be anybody left with our identity to go home. He's being very specific that they need to be intentional in raising their children. Intentional in their parenting that they would not just let the Babylonian culture raise their kids, but that they would raise their children. And that they would choose their spouses. I didn't buy into this theory when I was growing up, but now I buy into this theory. I think I need to be the one to choose Olivia and Amy's husbands when they're 35. Forty's getting close. I want grandkids. You choose their spouses. You take the, the, the responsibility to do this well. But above all, teach them who their God is. Don't let them forget their identity. And multiply. Don't dwindle away. Don't disappear like the northern tribe of Israel. Now, prior to this, there were two, two sections, two kingdoms, of Jews. There was the northern tribe who was exiled into Assyria and they disappeared off the map. We don't, they just intermarried where they were at and there was nobody to come home when the exile was over. He's saying don't disappear like the northern tribe because God is going to recreate Israel and he will recreate Israel through your descendants. Work for the peace and prosperity of the city. Now, just so you know, this is the first time in Scripture where God says, pray for those who are different from you. This is the first time in Scripture where God instructs the children of Israel after He called them out to pray for their enemies. Always before, it's, I will destroy your enemies. But here, it's get comfortable because you're going to be here a while. Pray for your enemies. Work for peace and prosperity of the city that you're in. Be a blessing where you're at. Create, because you were created to work. But don't serve money. Live in peace. Don't get caught up in their way of doing things. Don't get caught up in the Babylonian life. Live there. Be comfortable there. Pray for their prosperity. Pray for their peace, but don't get caught up in their lifestyle. Because you're going to be there 70 years. And whatever happens to Babylon happens to you. Now this is a very different message 
than the message that the people wanted to hear. If my dad had said in this letter, Emmanuel, get comfortable, settle in, because you're never coming back home, at that time, I would have been furious. What do you mean I'm never coming back home? I'm going to Indiana as soon as I can. Just so you know, that's not my thought now. Colorado is my preference. But at that time, I wanted to get back home and buy that pickup truck back. I was sick of that stupid car. But here's the clinch. It's God's will that you're there. You're not there by accident. God sent you to Babylon. Their false prophets were saying, God's going to rescue you from Babylon. You're not supposed to be here. But Jeremiah is saying, no, God sent you to Babylon. You're there for a reason. And he's detailed that reason because they would not stay close to God. They kept abandoning God's call on their life. And these are the consequences that he had promised way back when he first called them out of Egypt. Don't spend your time complaining, but trust God's ability to work through your circumstances. And I said there's some universal truths in the book of Jeremiah, and I believe this is one of them. I believe it's important for us as Christians to not get so caught up in wanting everything to be our way in the world that we live in, but to pray for and work for the prosperity of the culture that we're in, but realize that even though we may live in a certain country, our primary identity is in the kingdom of God. I am a Christian before I am an American. Now, I am a proud American, but I am a Christian before I am an American. And if we get those two confused, then all of a sudden our stories get mixed up, as we talked about last week. We have to trust that God can work through our circumstances no matter how frustrating they may be. It's not about me getting my way. It's about allowing God to work through me even if the circumstances in which I find myself are less than ideal. And then we come to Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans that I have for you. But I want you to understand that the plans are not individual plans. They're plans for the community. When God is saying, I know the plans I have for you, it's I know the plans that I have for you, my people in Babylon. And the plan is that he would be able to reveal himself through them. We trace that all the way back to God's call to Abraham that the whole world would be blessed through you. And he plans to bring their descendants back to that place, the crossroads of the known world, so that everybody would know that he was God. He planned to bless all the nations of the world through them. Now, I believe that God knows the plans that he has for me as an individual, and I trust that. But this passage is saying the big plan is not that one individual would have a certain thing mapped out for him. The big plan is that they would be the people of God living in a difficult situation. And this, when he says, I have plans to give you a hope and a future, This verse was given to give hope to those who are facing some difficult times. Hope to those facing a lion's den if they did not refuse to pray to the king of Babylon. We know the story of Daniel. Daniel was told that you can't pray to your God, you can only pray to the king of Babylon for for this period of time, or else you get thrown into a lion's den. And yet Daniel, who had received this letter from Jeremiah, said, I have to pray to my God. I'm not trying to disrespect the king of of Babylon, but I have to pray to my God. I cannot pray to a king. I have to pray to God. 
And in that decision, when he knew that people were out to get him, he knew that people were watching him, trying to catch him. And when he sank to his knees in his window facing Jerusalem, I'm guessing that this verse may have been one ringing through his ears. I know you're scared at this moment to get on your knees and pray the way that you're supposed to. But I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. But not just Daniel. It was also those who were facing the fiery furnace. And Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. As they were told, bow down to worship the king. The image that the king set up of himself. And they refused to bow. And I know that they were scared when they refused to get on their knees and bow down. I know that they knew in their heads this would be so easy to just bow down. We don't have to say the prayer. We just bow down. Nobody knows what we're doing. But God had told them through a letter from Jeremiah that he knew the plans that he had for them. Plans to give them a hope and a future. And when Daniel had to make the decision, do I get on my knees or do I not? He got on his knees because he had the hope that God was in this. And when Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego had to make a decision, do I stand up or do I get on my knees? They stayed standing because of the hope that God had for them. What I want us to get out of this is whenever we look at this verse and whenever we drink out of these coffee cups, we tend to think, that this verse means everything's going to be wonderful. Is anybody else old enough now to realize that that doesn't really exist? My plans, my dreams don't always go the way that I want them to. This verse wasn't given to a group of people who had everything going their way and God said, see, I'm just giving you everything that you want. This verse was given to a group of people who were facing the most difficult situation they'd ever faced. They had to maintain their identity as a people of God in a completely pagan city when their lives would be demanded of them. And they didn't know what would happen if they chose to kneel. Daniel did not know that God was going to rescue him from the lion's den. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they said they knew God could, but they didn't know that he would. This verse gives hope when things aren't going right. This verse says even when life is chaotic, hold on to God. Be the people of God, because that's His plan. His plan is that we would represent Him. That we would be formed into His people. Because He knows the plans that He has for us. He hasn't abandoned us. God is listening to your prayers. He was listening to the prayers that, ended, that sent Daniel to the lion's den. And he said, if you seek me wholeheartedly, you will find me. You're not alone. You feel like you're alone, but you're not alone. And I can remember my early days in Colorado Springs, I felt absolutely abandoned. God, why would you call me here? when I don't know anybody? Why would you put me with a roommate? And I was messy, but I'd never been with that, that messy of a person before. Why would you put me with this person? God, why would you do this to me? And God said, I'm with you. I want you to be there. I'm with you. Even when we feel like God has abandoned us, he hasn't. I know that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as they were headed to that fiery furnace, I know running through their head was a sense of, where are you, God? Why are we here? Why are we facing this? And God's answer was very clearly, I'm here with you in the fiery furnace. Because the guards said, didn't we throw in three, but there's a fourth one walking around. Even in a fiery furnace, even in a lion's den, even where you're at right now, God is with you. 
As the worship team comes, I want us to look again at Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. They're plans for good and not for disaster. Plans to give you a future and a hope. In those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. As we look at what's going on in our culture around us, as we look at what's going on in the world, and what's going on in the United States, it's very easy for us to feel like, God, where are you? But I think God's message to us is the same message to them. My call is that you would be a people of God who are formed in my image. Represent me there. But build homes and live in them. Plant gardens and eat the food that grows. Have children and grandchildren. Pray for the prosperity and the peace of the city where you're at. Be a blessing where you're at. But don't forget, this is not your home. You're not from here. You belong to another kingdom. And don't forget that. And if the world breaks out in nuclear war this week, we belong to another kingdom. If the riots continue across America, we belong to another kingdom. Our identity is not in what takes place around us. The plans that God has for us are that we would be formed into his people. And when we seek him, we will find him. Let's stand together as we close with the song I refuse.
Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the plans that you have for us as a community. We thank you for the hope that you bring us, even in the midst of life being chaotic. And as we leave this place, I pray that we will keep in mind your plans for us, your plans for us to be shaped as your people, to reflect your glory wherever we go, to be a blessing in the world that we find ourselves in today. I pray that we would refuse to buy into the lies that surround us, but that we would truly be your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And you are dismissed.